But today is a niche market, is 1% of the eating and cooling market, is a fast growing sector. The demand for cooling will go dramatically. It's, it's already doing it um, today, but for the next 10 years, we expect 50% increase and nearly doubling by 2040. What happens today is that we have big issues. The cooling demand requires a lot of electricity. And we see sometimes some topics in newspapers like regarding data centers, for example. We know that this electricity demand is in a short period in summertime with some hot um, season in, in during the day, during an hour, during the week, and creating some tensions in the electricity grid. We know that the number of days of cooling, this is a Eurostat a map, will increase in, in, in the future with the issue in big cities of urban heat island. And that would be a huge topic. We see that cooling will not be the only answer, but it's a big topic, urban heat island. And we need several technologies to answer this uh, issue. Today, we present to a series of technologies focusing on solar and, and geo solar thermal and geothermal to see what are the possibilities of these technologies. So just to map the frame, it's a niche, but be careful it will be growing and creating a lot of tensions for the energy transition. With this short introduction, I'm now giving the floor to Madis from the European Commission to give us his perspective. Madis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, and uh, I'm representing the European Commission where I'm working uh, in the DG Energy, in the Energy Efficiency Unit. I tried to show my slides and show here here they should come i confirm it's perfect thank you yeah thanks good uh and uh yeah the original request to, was to speak about uh cooling uh, uh in the energy market uh, regulations today in europe and uh thank you for this opportunity to speak about uh, this particular topic but uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce my presentation with a general discussion whether we actually need um, uh, market regulation in the cooling area. And typically why we are, are having the market regulation in the, in the energy field is to address the market failures. And uh, in order to address the cooling sector, there should be some obvious market failures that uh, cannot be removed in other ways. Uh, so there is, uh, there should be a certain uh, firm case that uh, there is a market intervention necessary if we are going to regulate, uh, regulate the cooling field. And uh, yeah, in general, why we are addressing the cooling or any kinds of uh, energy market is, uh, is to ensure that there is a fair allocation of the risk uh, benefits and, um, and burden between the market participants. So, and uh, first of all, uh, secondly, there is also important that uh, we have the access to the modern energy service in the energy markets. And that's the reason why, why there is uh, regulation in the energy field. And finally, it's also important to remind that there, are, there could be environmental co considerations why we are regulating the energy market and from the different uh, environmental and climate perspectives. But uh, for the cooling market, uh, in fact, uh, there isn't that much uh, uh, regulation and legislation in the EU. Although yeah, in the, the EU's uh, uh, EU's uh, uh, general uh, legislation on the energy is uh, quite solid one. We have more than 50 different uh, legal acts on the, uh, on the regulation of the energy market and uh, in different, uh, different areas. But uh, these are not caused by the problems that we are, can observe in the cooling market. But anyway, the cooling is uh, addressed in uh, several legal acts already, and uh, and there are various considerations why it's done. And first of all, uh, I would mention the Energy Efficiency Directive that uh, 
addresses the cooling uh, in to some extent and uh, considers that the cooling is one of the one of the segments that uh, where we should ensure more efficient energy consumption and uh, therefore we have some provisions on the cooling and uh, and uh, efficient cooling can contribute to the energy efficiency target for certainly secondly we have the renewable energy directive that is also addressing to some of the cooling issues and uh, uh, together with the uh, heating issues and uh, as we have renewable energy target and this has sectoral contributions uh, in the member states uh, for the heating and cooling so this means that the cooling uh, and the renewables in the cooling can contribute to the overall increase of the renewable energy use in the in the European Union and uh, therefore there are some regulated aspects on how to calculate the renewables for the cooling and uh, what are the targets for the cooling sector in the general uh, policy to increase the share of uh, renewables in the heating and cooling. It's also the cooling is also addressed in the energy performance of the buildings directive where the uh, cooling is one of the aspects that is considered in the general general energy performance of the buildings and that needs to be taken into account when planning and uh, analyzing the building energy demand. And the last piece of the European energy efficiency regulation is the uh, legislation that is applicable to the energy using products and this includes also the also the cooling equipment and uh, there are energy labeling requirements and also the eco design requirements that are addressing the cooling equipment and finally yeah I can also mention that uh, the environmental requirements are something that that are considered in the regulation of the cooling uh, cooling aspects and cooling equipment. So, for example, there are requirements related to the FCAS use in the cooling equipment, and uh, and uh, this is something that uh, is. Um, addressed uh, in context of the regulation regulation of the cooling markets uh, but the, more specifically why we are addressing the uh, cooling in the energy efficiency leg legislation and uh, this this is w one of the areas uh, why the, the revision of the energy efficiency directive is done and uh, and uh, as you have told in the introduction the cooling demand is increasing and uh, this needs to be taken also into account in the in the general energy efficiency policy how to ensure that the uh, cooling equipment uh, and the cooling solutions are efficient ones and uh, they also contribute to the more efficient energy consumption. And for these purposes, uh, the energy efficiency directive that is recently agreed by the Council and the Parliament says that uh, there should be several instruments in place in the member states that uh, help to address the cooling sector. And first of all, there should be clear planning on the heating and cooling related uh, issues. And uh, this means that uh, there should be national level planning where the member states analyze their heating and cooling sector and uh, look at the options to develop uh, efficient district heating and cooling in their member states on a national level. And uh, secondly, the new directive triggers also more local level action and uh, this um, with this uh, new requirement that uh, is obliging the large municipalities having the population above 45,000, we envisage that uh, there should be local heating and cooling plans where the, uh, the cities and uh, 
other local governments uh, foresee how they are converting their heating and cooling sector into more decarbonized uh, heating and cooling sector. What the energy efficiency directive is um, defining or uh, prescribing is the definition of the efficient uh, district heating and cooling systems. And uh, you may ask why this is uh, so important, uh, why we are regulating this, uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, that the overall share of the district heating and cooling is relatively moderate in EU, that uh, together with the district heating, the, uh, the energy supplied uh, or the share of the energy supplied in the overall energy demand is somewhere at 12 percent in the EU in total. But at the same time, it's the sector where quite significant uh, support is available for the investments in the EU and where the member states are actively uh, modernizing the systems. And uh, with the new requirements in the energy efficiency directive, we try to ensure that uh, all the new investments that we are doing in the district heating and cooling systems, we help to decarbonize the sector. And, and with this uh, gradual movement and, uh, and the gradual tightening of the definition of the efficient district he heating and cooling, we are going to ensure that uh, uh, the new investments will lead to more efficient energy consumption and uh, smaller uh, carbon emissions in the district heating and cooling systems. So here is the schedule of the of the transition in the heating and cooling systems and the general ambition with the schedule is that uh, from year 2050 all the heat that is delivered through the efficient district heating and cooling systems comes from the renewable energies or the waste heat. Uh, there are also some other provisions that are important for the operation of the district heating and also the cooling systems is that uh, and these provisions include uh, mandatory planning of the of the uh, investments in the heating and cooling systems and uh, trying to ensure that uh, all the systems have a plan how to convert their existing uh, systems into efficient district heating and cooling systems and uh, with this planning uh, there will be more clear understanding how the transition in the heating and cooling sector takes place and uh, this new obligation will apply to all the systems that have the uh, energy input above five megawatts in the their efficient district heating and cooling systems. There will be also requirement uh, for the cost benefit analysis for all the large uh, energy installations having the capacity over one megawatt for the data centers and uh, varying uh, minimum capacity uh, for other types of installations and uh, this also can address uh, the cooling and uh, the availability of the waste cold uh, and uh, these installations that need to be where the cost benefit analysis need to, needs to be taken in, uh, in take place are those systems where the potential cooling uh, uh, supply could exceed five megawatts uh, or where the input energy of the system sees uh, above five megawatts of uh, energy throughout the year. So there are several very, very important uh, provisions in the new energy efficiency directive, how to ensure the efficiency of the uh, district heating and cooling systems. And uh, these are complemented with uh, other requirements in other directives. And although the cooling sector doesn't have that big role in the EU's energy demand uh, or that visible energy demand compared to the 
heating demand in the EU, there is a strong understanding that uh, this needs some attention and, um, and there are some instruments established in the EU legislation that uh, address the efficiency of the cooling and, and uh, refrigeration services. So thank you for the attention and the inviting me to this webinar and I'm glad to finish here. Thanks. Thank you, Matisse. You need a clear presentation on the current framework and uh, we will see if there are some questions for you in the Q&A session. Thank you, Matisse. Now let's move to Raven to explain us what are the different cooling technologies. Raven, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. Can you confirm that my screen is visible? I confirm full screen, but thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. As Philip has already mentioned, uh, we're a partner in the Cooling Down Project. And on behalf of Fraunhofer IEG, I would like to present something from one of the works that we've done and also place a little bit of a focus on key aspects for future systems, for future cooling systems. Um, I will briefly show you three points. That is the agenda for this slot. That is a little bit the importance of cooling, which I think everybody knows how important this is. Then go over to cooling technologies and some future key aspects that we have to keep in mind. And um, I'd like to finish also with some of the many, many best case examples that we can find. Um, well, the motto um, of, I think, the next years is to keep it cool. And this means also to keep it actually cool because we have uh, a rapidly increasing cooling demand that we have to face and we have to tackle with. And as you all know, this is uh, due to many factors like uh, we have high density of people and buildings, internal thermal loads, um, modern glass fronts, etc. So these and also let's say demographic and climatic factors play an important role. Um, and as already mentioned, we have approximately 15 to 20% of electricity going into providing uh, cooling or refrigeration. And this leads us a little bit to a problem because um, we have an increasing electricity demand with an increase of cooling uh, appliances. And also if we don't decarbonize the electricity used for that, then it's gonna lead to higher CO2 emissions. And of course, a higher risk of having power out outages. Um, on the right side, you can see, let's say, a pie diagram of Germany's um, um, demand or where the cooling is needed. And we can see that a lot of cooling is needed, for example, for air conditioning, but also for residential appliances like keeping fridges alive. Um, so as I mentioned, we have uh, a risk to tackle with, and this is not something uh, that happened in the past. It, happened, uh, it happens frequently. Uh, here you can see that, yes, we have buildings equipped with a lot of outdoor units and all these units need electricity. So we have, a, as the New York Times have uh, expressed it, a new and deadly risk for cities in the summer. We have power failures that we might be facing if um, our electricity grid is overloaded, especially with increasing ambient air temperatures. So this is something that we need to keep in, in mind also in terms of finding maybe alternative approaches. And this is where we are looking a little bit in, into the project or looking into the work um, of mapping cooling technologies that can be become, let's say, um, practical and uh, at some point um, market ready. So to divide them, we have divided them into the classical mechanical uh, uh, cooling technologies and also um, thermally driven um, technologies like absorption chillers and, and etc. But there are also a lot of other um, possibilities like natural cooling systems, um, either by evaporating water or by using free heat sinks like the air or the ground um, that can be used. And I think an important technology, and I explicitly mentioned it as a technology, is the aspect of using a storage system. Um, because in this way, we can use cooling generated at a different time to store it and provide it at, an, at another later time. Also, a focus that we have placed is to put several technologies into um, so-called technology radars to identify the, the progress of, of their technical readiness level. 
and they of course are various and they need a lot of um, development still at least the ones on the outer layers um, so we did a small survey within our consortium to find uh, key aspects um, of course as mentioned the electricity or electricity driven systems are are very high the importance um, especially when we talk about small scale systems but also passive cooling systems that can become important they depend on climatic conditions five generation grids uh, have been highlighted as uh, as important etc i will not go into each point uh, and there comes um, um, a point where we were thinking in the project whether to to uh, increase a little bit our uh, results and strengthening the results by um, having also your uh, opinion on this one. So that's why we're going to reach out um, to you and ask you maybe to participate in the survey that we had done internally. And we're hoping to get impulses from various stakeholders. And um, don't be afraid, this is a survey that will only last 20 to 30 minutes maximum. Um, so I was talking about key aspects. I will highlight some that are important. Um, we have five generation grids. Uh, what is this? Um, we're talking about bi-directional heating and cooling grids um, for urban or densely populated areas. Um, So-called prosumer grids as well, where uh, consumers become um, also producers, so they can uh, introduce the energy they're providing into a grid. And in this case, we're not only talking about cooling, but also about heating. And seasonal thermal storage bec uh, becomes very important in this case, because uh, here in this way, we can have a high integration of renewable energy. Um, also, um, subsurface cooling storage and shallow geothermal systems are very important. Uh, here we talk about systems going to the depth level of 400 meters and below. Um, and the subsurface is something like a storage. It can be used as a heat reservoir, either for a direct usage or by using geothermal probes or also heat pumps. Um, this can be used to supply complexes or city quarters with renewable heat. And as I mentioned, they can be used passively or naturally also in combination with other cooling uh, generators. Um, thermal storage solutions for long and intermediate term are also important. So the subverses, as mentioned, can be used for that. And also active cooling systems with a so-called ice storage integration or other storage possibilities are important. Um, furthermore, um, I think one important thing that we usually neglect is the optimization of a running system. So um, optimize, optimizing the cooling operation is, is, can lead to high efficiency values, especially if we think about the many, many part load conditions that, oper uh, that cooling systems have. So we're talking about dynamic and variable flow regimes for external circuits and also dynamic supply and cooling water temperatures and also integrate um, storage capacities and in, in the free cooling mode in such a way that control cost concepts become a little bit tailored to the system characteristics. And in order to achieve this, um, monitoring and the knowledge about how a system is being operated is, is of key importance. Um, another important aspect that we're also gonna highlight today is uh, thermally driven or solar cooling um, systems. So we're talking about thermally driven up or adsorption systems, um, small scale applications uh, going down to 10 kilowatt or even big scale applications are um, market ready, um, but usually confronted with high investment costs. But nevertheless, uh, we talk here about closed and open sorption systems, and they can also be used uh, for low temperature heat supply and ground regeneration. And the good thing is, and that's why I would, would like to close this um, features here is that we're talking here about a very low electricity demand for such systems. Coming over to some best case examples, um, in order to strengthen a little bit this uh, perspective, um, we have on the upper part, we have the Mine Water 2.0 project in Herlin and Netherlands. Uh, we're talking here about a hydro geothermal system with geothermal doublets and a seasonal thermal aquifer storage in mines. Um, the commissioning took place uh, in 2005 and has been continuously uh, expanded. And the depth values here are going down to 800 meters below surface. And when we talk here about cooling, we talk about a cooling temperature of 
close to 15 degrees Celsius. And when we talk about heating, we talk about 35 degrees. And then of course, uh, the uh, introduction of heat pumps is necessary. Uh, in terms of capacities, it's more or less for heating or for cooling at four megawatt. Um, also data centers that has been mentioned already. Here an example of many, uh, of one of the many data centers that are, are quite efficient. Uh, the co-location data center, co-location IX in Hamburg. Um, it's a geothermal cooling system that has been used in a data center in the bunker. Um, the geothermal probes go down to 200 meters and they provide a cooling capacity going up to 800 kilowatt. And with this system, uh, and in combination also with concrete activation and adiabatic reject heat devices, the power user's effectiveness value, that means how much electricity is used for providing IT services is very low, going down to 1.05. Um, moreover, um, I would like to show you this energy grid in Berlin Ad Adlersdorf. Uh, actually, it's a reactivated uh, um, cooling grid uh, that is coupled from, the, from, from various subsystems. Um, and also an ice storage that has been reactivated is used within an overall control strategy to make the operation of the cooling network a little bit more flexible. In total, we're talking about seven chillers and five free cooling towers, um, allowing a cooling capacity at peak times of four megawatts. Uh, the efficiency increase that has been uh, achieved with, within this project goes up to 65% and the reduction of primary energy uh, is done closely to 50%. Another project in terms of uh, optimization of control is the uh, REX project, that's an abbreviation. And here we talk about control strategies for energy efficient cooling systems. Um, here, different installations, um, talk about 10 installations with 14 absorption chillers and the three year monitoring have been used to develop control strategies for standalone uh, absorption chillers and complete cooling systems. And a model predictive system control um, was um, used in order to um, minimize the, uh, the energy used in terms also of primary energy so that the cooling generation becomes efficient. The reduction achieved here is in the level of 25% if we talk about the specific electricity demand and furthermore, of course, the primary energy consumption and operating costs can be reduced up to 70%. Last, um, solar cooling is a project that I had uh, um, done in the past. It's a solar cooling project. It's not within Europe, but nevertheless, it is a um, strong solar cooling project in terms of um, small scale applications in, in for solar cooling appliances. The commissioning started in 2014. Uh, four pilot plants with uh, heat coming from a CPC. Um, solar thermal system and also thermal energy storage uh, has been uh, introduced together with the dynamic flow control and when i say about small scale i was meaning 50 to 120 kilowatt with supply temperatures to go uh, between 8 and 14 degrees um, electrical efficiency values going up to 23 uh, had been uh, achieved and this is uh, an alternative as mentioned before to you utilizing electricity. Uh, I would like to close with uh, again two, um, let's say subsurface um, geothermal cooling systems, the Miss Ellie project. Here we talk about a multivalent cold supply using free cooling, borehole heat exchangers, ice storage, and compression chillers. It's a joint project with a company for battery manufacturing and uh, cooling capacity is in the level of 300 kilowatt at the temperature level of 16 degrees. The project is going now into a demonstration and another um, solution for applying uh, geothermal boreholes or, or um, is to use a, a scalable system, um, a concept that is using geothermal probes for combined heating and cooling. And it can be used in such a way that it is uh, uh, not using a lot of area due to its shape, and therefore it has a very low impairment on the existing infrastructure. So this can also be uh, a solution for highly densely, highly populated areas. So 
I hope I'm still within the time frame and with this I would like to close and thank you for your attention. Indeed, Raven, thank you for this full panorama of technology. So now we have a better understanding of uh, uh, the technologies. Mad is printing the framework, you're printing the technologies. And now we will move on to have uh, the presentation from Simon Pedudo from URAC to see here what is currently the cooling demand. So Simon, we are listening to you to know this data. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I try to share my screen. So can you see my screen? I confirm full screen, but thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, then uh, thank you again, Philip. Welcome to the presentation entitled with Cooling Demand and Impact on the Energy System. It's my pleasure to present today at the webinar of the Cooling Down Project. My, um, yeah, exactly. My name is Simon Pezzuto, and I am the project coordinator of the sister project, so Cool Light. Yeah, basically, first of all, I would like to go into definitions because when we speak about cooling, we speak about space cooling and process cooling. This is uh, what cooling is made of. So per definition, space cooling is defined as the removal of heat from the air to cool indoor air and to ensure healthy conditions and thermal comfort to the occupants of an enclosed space which could be that one of a building, but also of a car. And space cooling lowers the temperature of the air in contrast, for example, to ventilation. And typical set points of indoor air temperature for space cooling varying among 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. And in contrast to that, we have process cooling, which is defined as the removal of heat from processes. For example, plastic mold cooling, but today we heard also about cooling of data centers from products or from a confined space containing these processes or products in view of maintaining the required set temperature. This definition uh, comes from a formal tender of the European Commission entitled with renewable cooling under the revised renewable energy directive. Yeah, and uh, according to the request, I speak about cooling demand, but also here uh, we have to take care um, to distinguish among cooling demand and cooling consumption because the space cooling demand, or better defined as useful energy demand, also entitled sometimes if any space cooling request or space cooling need. Is the net heat removed from space to be cooled? And in contrast to that, we have the space cooling consumption, which is better defined with final energy consumption, also space cooling consumption, which is the energy input of the space cooling generators. And of course, as such, the two quantities differ by disparate conversion factors. In fact, the energy efficiency ratio, in this case, we take the energy efficiency ratio, not the seasonal energy efficiency ratio, for example, for electrical driven space cooling preprint is more than one. So the uh, average in the EU is about three. And because of that, the final energy consumption for space cooling is lower than the useful final energy demand for space cooling. And uh, of course, in the case of space heating, it's the way around where you have an average um, energy efficiency of 85%. So you see this 15% 15, 15 higher of space heating consumption and in cooling, like already mentioned, it's uh, the way around. Next slide. Yeah, basically I would like to expose a few methodologies to quantify uh, the space cooling demand. Uh, this has been utilized in the past in projects like, for example, hot maps, uh, Anna maps, currently also in moderate, and um, those data go also inside the Cool Life project. So basically one way to uh, quantify or better to, say, to assess the space cooling demand is to pass by de facto uh, the space cooling consumption, taking into consideration the amount of air conditioners per type 
in a certain area, for example, a country. Then take into consideration also the equivalent full load hours and the work input. And uh, the work input is given through the installed capacity by air conditioning type divided through the energy efficiency indicator, which in this case is indicated at the seasonal energy efficiency ratio. Here it's written uh, not work input, but work electricity, because uh, the absolute majority of uh, space cooling devices at the EU level nowadays um, uh, vapor compression, electrical driven vapor compression units. And once you have the energy consumption, uh, you basically transform that into the space cooling demand simply by multiplying by the, um, the seasonal energy efficiency ratio of the different space cooling units, or you can also, of course, let it that way here. This is also a methodology utilized in this uh, publication indicated here in the font below. Yeah, basically the figures which then arise are following. In this case, uh, we see a result for the residential space cooling uh, demand at AU20 um, AU level, let's say, where we have uh, quantified those uh, space cooling demand for movables, also called uh, portable units with not that much, about uh, four terawatt. But which is uh, what is very pertinent is the demand uh, provided by small split units with a capacity installed of less than five kilowatt with nearly 40 terawatt hour, a little bit less, but not much less. The big split units with an installed capacity of more than five kilowatt. And inside here also we have the ducted systems. The variable refrigerant flow systems are just minor, about one terawatt hour, present especially in office buildings. And then we have also the chiller, air to water, with our installed capacity of less than 400 kilowatt. And the chiller, water to water, again, with our installed capacity of less than 400 kilowatt. Again, not much, about one terawatt. And what is missing here is, of course, uh, those um, vapor compression systems, or let's say space cooling systems, uh, which are present also in the industrial sector. So chill or air to water with a capacity installed of more than 400 kilowatt. And this is valid also for the chill or water to water, again, with a capacity installed of more than 400 kilowatt. But uh, also here, um, we are missing the rooftops and uh, the package systems, which are so less present in the residential sector that in Europe that they can be neglected. Yeah, and another methodology to assess the space cooling demand uh, basically is uh, the way to carry out a data assembly, uh, applying, for example, a box plot methodology uh, for statistical exclusion. And you see a screenshot of a formal um, research of this type carried out during my PhD thesis, where we tried to find um, uh, respective data country by country, and to see that they then vary. A typical case, for example, is for Austria, where we have here 39 kilowatt hour per square meter year, 38 and 25 and apply in the box plot methodology. Of course, what happens is that the 25 then gets excluded and the more robust average is then calculated uh, through the remaining uh, data. Yeah, what you see um, basically is then um, that you, that um, let's say uh, results of such a kind of research. So the assessment of space cooling demand by data collection and statistical exclusions. What we see here is the space cooling demand uh, per country. And we have a weighted average, which has been weighted by the cooled flow area of uh, respective countries. We have the amount of data utilized to form the different columns. We have the error bars, and then also the uncertainty percentage of the collected data to form the columns. Results are very clear. We have uh, very high values for countries such as Spain, Greece, Italy, and then uh, we have lower values 
four counties allocated rather in the northern part of Europe, like Ireland, Sweden, and at the time also United Kingdom. Um, here are uh, these results provided uh, by the tertiary part. In contrast to that, before we saw the residential part. Here again, we have the typical high values for southern located counties, like again, uh, Spain and Italy and Greece. And again, the lower values for Ireland, for Sweden, for the United Kingdom. But what is interesting also to see is that uh, for the residential part, we have a value, an average value of about 41 kilowatt hour per square meter year, while it's more than double in the tertiary part, with 92. And nowadays, uh, what we see is an increase of uh, space cooling demand, especially in the residential part. Um, because in former times, uh, space cooling was especially provided in offices, but of course, uh, you know, it's in the health sector, like hospitals and in other uh, tertiary sectors. But it is more and more also installed nowadays in the private homes, in households, due to an increase of uh, comfort requests by the European population, but also, like said, nowadays, today, uh, due to um, the heat island effect and also uh, due to uh, extreme weather events uh, like heat waves. Yeah, and then concerning the impact on the energy system, or like uh, already stated by the colleague from Germany, uh, we have to mention the grid overload because, of course, like like already mentioned, 99%, even more than 99% of the installed space cooling systems in the European Union are electrical powered vapor compression systems. And this can lead to um, grid issues during uh, heat waves. And therefore, it's also very important uh, to go in a direction of renewable energy produced space cooling. Um, like, for example, solar cooling systems or thermal driven heat pumps, which can also be powered by geothermal energy. But uh, I also would like to mention is uh, natural cooling, passive cooling and free cooling. And again, since cooling is a very, let's say, unexplored uh, topic so far, it's important to have definitions so that we know what we are speaking about. So natural cooling is defined as uh, by the use of natural and renewable energy sources, like for example, air, water, ground temperature, which is the lower temperature compared with the air inside the building, or could be also another kind of infrastructure. Passive cooling is intended as an approach that makes use of the building design and materials in order to keep a comfortable temperature inside the buildings without the use of mechanical or electrical devices. Typical example, shedding systems. And then we have free cooling. Free cooling is a cooling technique that stores cold when temperatures are low and absorbs heat when room temperatures are high. Thus, it uses the low temperature of a heat source to efficiently decrease energy consumption for cooling. Typical, typical examples are water bodies, for example. And you can see from the definition that basically passive cooling and free cooling could be seen as subsectors of natural cooling. Okay, that's all from my side until now. And if you have questions, I will be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Indeed, uh, thanks to our uh, three panelists for this excellent presentation. So let's now move to the Q&A session. So you could see we have uh, about 10 minutes Q&A session. So um, first, you can raise your hand, but you can also use the Q&A tool. And I see that we have also already a set of questions. So first, uh, we have a question from uh, Charles Marania from the Belgium in France. A question to, I don't know, who wants to answer this one. What do you think about the economic relevance of sorption systems? The machines seem expensive compared to conventional vapor compression heat pumps. Maybe Reven, you can answer this question first? 
Well, the question is very broad, but I think it can fulfill more than 10 minutes. But um, um, the person asking this, of course, is right. Um, when we talk about specific investment costs, like uh, how much money you need per kilowatt of cooling capacity, uh, we have a much higher value for sorption-based systems than we have for the conventional systems. Um, so the, the system needs to pay off in a different way. And the only way it can pay off, it, it, uh, if it has less operating costs and maybe also create other benefits like provide heating. Uh, so when we talk about sorption systems, um, we might think uh, as well as a, uh, as a uh, heat unit that is transforming uh, low temperature heat into intermediate temperature heat so that we can uh, use this um, energy for heating as well. So instead of um, um, combusting fuel in the winter, we can use such a system um, so the, another way to make such an application more cost effective is uh, to use it for a different um, operation regime. So, but uh, the only way to get, get into uh, a cost effective, uh, uh, let's say point uh, is to reduce the operating costs um, and have it for another application. Um, and in combination maybe with, uh, um, a reduction potential uh, um, associated to CO2 emissions. Uh, there might be other benefits as well that the system might be making it more pre profitable. So this is a very short answer answer on this on this broad question. But maybe other colleagues would like to add something as well. Simon, Melis. Yeah. Thanks. I think it should be also mentioned that the economics of scale, this would be also a possibility for thermal driven heat pumps uh, to lower the costs, which are exceptionally high. And um, I don't know exactly for other counties, but um, I had the possibility to carry out a market investigation for thermal driven heat pumps in Italy. And there we are, let's say at the level of test cases or case studies, but if of course the amount of machineries installed in July would uh, increase, then also the producers would, uh, let's say, make benefit out of the economics of scale and the costs uh, could decrease. Thank you. Okay, we have a compliment question for you, Simon, also from Charles, is that uh, in slide number five, I don't know which one, are these figures related to the residential sector only? Exactly, exactly. These are related only to the residential sector. I wanted to show especially those because here we have uh, the highest increase uh, per sector in Europe. Uh, here we have about 80 terawatt hours of space cooling demand, which means that if you consider the seasonal energy efficiency ratio of the different uh, systems, you come to about 20 terawatt hours of space cooling um, consumption. And uh, if we sum up those of, uh, let's say, residential and tertiary uh, part, uh, then in Europe, we come out to about 100 uh, terawatt hours of space cooling consumption in this case. Thank you, Simon. Two more questions. One um, from Nigel Taylor. Regarding the equipment needed for solar thermal and thermal cooling, what fraction is made in the EU and how much imported? I don't know if some of you have a data on that. No, so probably something to put both in cool life and uh, cooling and project. Maybe if we have some resources to, to investigate this issue, but thank you, Nigel, for the question. Yeah, well, I just know that, uh, for example, um... There are countries like France where companies, can we state names of companies? No, I don't know. <laughs> there are, there's a famous uh, French um, space cooling equipment producer, which holds more than 50% of the share um, and also has good shares in other countries. But of course, uh, we have still, um, well, let's say in the free energy crisis period, we had a lot of, um, let's say market imports uh, from Asia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's a, another question, but maybe one question from my side to, to Malice. Um, do you think you as a, as a legislator, 
you have enough data from Eurostat and, uh, and, and the cooling data per type of domain in general? Well, uh, yeah, I would say that uh, with data, it's not that easy for us. And uh, certainly this is something where also the member states are lacking the data on cooling and uh, where the data gathering practices need to be upscaled to to respond to various needs uh, that are linked with the planning of the cooling sector. Mm -hmm. no, because indeed when we see the EED and, and the focus on data centers, it would have been good to see what is the share of these data centers in the total cooling demand. But yeah, and something we both uh, Simon uh, investigate in cool life, but also us in, in the cooling demand. So hope uh, we will use on, on, on this together to find a good solution for, for statistical data collection. Yeah, that's very welcome. Thanks. Sorry for sorry for interrupting. I might just state that um, in comparison to space heating and uh, domestic hot water, the space cooling sector is just, uh, let's say, barely explored. There's a real lack of data in a uh, space cooling uh, section. But uh, there are um, institutions uh, which hold data on uh, market shares, um, also of imports and exports. For example, Eurovent is one of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so these data per se are monitored and they exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And final question. So it's from Andy Fru. It's an interesting question for technologies and innovation. How much can the fifth generation heat networks reduce the peak power demand in dense urban areas? I think it's it what would be the key for the future, no? No, Simon, Reven, Madis. Well, I'm gonna be a little bit uh, uh, special on this answer. I'm gonna say fully. Because uh, if we think about um, a, a generation grid where somebody that is a or a cooling generator that is a, a producer as well, not only a consumer, um, can offer cooling uh, due to having an uh, PV solar plant installed in a, on its building, uh, and this cooling is not needed on the same building and can be transported for a grid to another consumer then you actually don't need uh, electricity. So the peak power demand can, I think, uh, can be reduced quite drastically. If, uh, uh, if such a system with the different capabilities of, of every consumer and prosumer uh, is, is uh, identified and controlled in such an efficient way that um, the demands are covered, then we can reduce the peak demands so that we don't have any failures in any systems or we can reduce also the cost because um, peak demands also cost money. Okay, I just like to have this last question is, is for Madis because I think we need also to answer this one. Uh, from Jean Sebastian Brock. So are there also uh, plans some adaptation policies that can be relevant to promote sustainable cooling? as EED is mostly focusing on active cooling. So why not in eco design regulation, we could have also some further regulation on, on reducing the cooling. Well, that's a good question. And thank you for the, this and uh, what I can comment here, yeah. Uh, indeed, uh, the energy performance of the buildings directive is uh, addressing this to some extent that uh, it uh, looks into the uh, moderation of the energy demand in the buildings and trying to identify the solutions that can provide uh, cooling efficiently. But uh, this has limitations. And, uh, and another thing that uh, could be there, but uh, is uh, restricted by the uh, EU general legislation is the fact that uh, we don't have any instruments that could address uh, the spatial planning by the member states. We have general planning instruments uh, in the energy efficiency directive, but the spatial, the spatial planning is the competence of the member states and regions in the EU. And you cannot uh, prescribe that uh, this is something that uh, 
needs to be taken into account in the spatial planning of the municipalities or any other institutions that are taking care of this task in the member states. So Thank that's you. My brief summary. That is indeed, indeed, and probably we will liaise on that in the future because in both Project Cool Life and um, Quindon, we have also some activities in policy and regulation to, to propose some recommendations. With that, I want to close this first panel with interesting discussion. Thank you, uh, Madis, for the policy framework, Raven for the cooling technologies, and Simon for the cooling demand and, and, the, and the perspective. Really excellent presentation, so thanks a lot to all you. Now we move to the second session. It's about case studies ready to use uh, technologies, geothermal and solar thermal, with a small change in the agenda. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Gus van Gelder from Groenland is not able to present, so you will have a surprise in Tevafim. We have another presentation. But to start with, I give the floor to Javier Oshoyaga from UPV, the University of Valencia, to present us the work on, on, on cooling the pathway to energy transition into any remote cooling technologies into CFs. Javier, Hello, the floor can, I guess you can see me and. Uh, not yet. Not yet. You should, perhaps. But we can hear you. Um, and uh, I should scan, uh, share my screen now. So perhaps you see my screen. It's coming. Perfect. Full screen mode. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for being for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm Javier Chuguilla from the Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. And I'm going to focus on a little different aspect than just the technology aspect, which has been covered by the previous uh, speakers. I want to focus more on the uh, impact that these particular cooling technologies will, uh, would have in this local context and uh, specifically in the uh, in the local context of the of the um, of the cities, and this uh, question can be related to a um, topic which is called the SEAPs, which are the Strategy Energy Action Plans, which I'm going to talk about in the in my presentation to present what are the SEAPs first of all, because I'm aware that not many, of, perhaps some of you do not are not so let's say, aware about the, the importance of SEAPs or strategy energy action plans in the context of local energy, then I would like to talk a little bit about some limitations of these SEAPs in regard particularly to cooling and how we can improve. So our state of knowledge about cooling technologies in this uh, more uh, impact related context. And I, I'm going to talk very briefly about the case study we have in Valencia. We are just starting because as you know, um, the cooling down project is starting. But I'm going to refer what we are doing in the city of Valencia to tackle this, this question, this aspect. And first of all, I would like to briefly brief you about what are the SEAPs and why they are important, what they are, they are relevant for our questions. For instance, in, in, in Europe, there are uh, more than 11,000 cities here. You can see in the website of, of EU cities uh, Europe how many cities, and with the with green dots, you can see in the map that these SEAPs have a very high coverage of the of the cities in Europe, and specifically in some of can, some countries like you see in Italy, Spain, or other countries like Belgium. But in many other countries, there are also many cities with strategy energy action plans, which were uh, launched in the under the umbrella of the Covenant of of Mayors Initiative for Climate and Energy. So it is an important part or important component of the European strategy to. Uh, decarbonize and to uh, abut emissions and more than 341 millions of people are now covered with a in a SEAP and the most important cities have their SEAP. So it's an important aspect to take into account when we talk about um, measures and specifically like in cooling measures about improvement of our energy system. So these SEAPs are relevant because they realize this principle of acting locally to, let's say, to engage in, in, in global projects. And uh, just talking about the, the methodology of a SEAP, if you are not uh, knowledgeable about that, the city council has to support the SEAP with, via a commitment and prepare a strategy energy action plan for the city, 
which is, is a follow-up step. So in this strategy energy action plan, you or the city has to specify what are the plans in the different uh, sectors which have to do with the greenhouse gas emissions. And then there are revisions of these actions and how the plan is being developed throughout uh, the time. So uh, typically here you can see a snapshot of how this looks like. There is a website in which these SEAPs or st strategy energy action plans are publicly, um, let's say, released. And you can even for the for the public, they can follow these plans and they can, let's say, um, have a monitoring about the, uh, let's say, the performance of the city in terms of decarbonization. Yeah, you can see, for instance, how in many of the cities in my in my country, uh, Valencia are with their SEAPs and they are, let's say, covered by this type of strategy and action plans. So I want to use now the word SEAPs just not to refer so much to the, to the covenant of action signatory, but to the specific plan in each of the cities. So if we have a SEAP, why, why bother? Let's say it's perfect, we have a plan. But it's not so easy because there are several concerns in which uh, we have to jump into to understand that, let's say, SEAPs is something we have to still develop further and specifically for certain technologies like cooling. So the first one, first concern we have to, to mention here is that the complexity of estimating greenhouse gas emissions itself at local scale is very high. So there are no standard approaches to really calculate greenhouse gas emissions at city scale. And although there are some rules, these rules are uh, not, not very exhaustive and sometimes not very precise. And I won't go to explain this a little bit uh, in, a, in the follow-up. The second concern about SERPs is that the measures that we have to decarbonize to abut emissions in the SERPs are uh, sometimes not very specific to the technologies. They are not very, let's say, uh, let's say exact on how a given technology can really impact on the greenhouse gas emissions via a given technology de development. So it's very difficult from the SEAP to assess their impact on greenhouse gas emissions and also to follow what is the success, what is the impact of these measures in terms of monetary or let's say of the costs we are incurring when developing these type of solutions. And this is very specific, uh, specifically important also when we talk about cooling as we are going to talk about later. So as just an example, I would like to show you like in, 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 let, in this re region council of Valencia, we have certain documents which specify the methodologies to, let's say, to implement these SEAPs in our local stage, which are quite similar over Europe. So these methodologies, they include typically uh, the municipal sector, which are all the greenhouse gas emissions that depend, depend upon public decision. And we have also the, 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 the private sector, which are all the greenhouse gas emissions, which are more dependent on private sector decisions on the stakeholders at private level. So as you can see here, the share is very, very unequal. Only about 4% of the greenhouse gas emissions really do depend on the decisions of the public bodies. And the rest is not directly dependent of the decision like the council or the municipality. So there is no, in Spain, for instance, there is no direct funding for this 96% of the possible measures. And just to list these type of measures, what they are, sorry, this is in Spanish, but I just to sh show you very, very slightly that those measures related to the production of heating and cooling are on one hand, those related to the municipal appliances here. There, are, there is a code name here, MA1, and on the other extreme, we have all the productions of cool and heat due to the private sectors, which are measures that are not directly covered in the SEAP, mainly because they do not depend on the public decision. So here we have to take into account that SEAPs are an excellent methodology, but there are current limitations on how their impact is really going to be assessed and going to be put forward in public decision. So. You can see here also from the type of information that this monitoring of the CEPs is providing that there are also limitations. For instance, in the in the features that the Valencia Municipal Regional Council is using to, let's say, to assess the impact of certain investments in uh, in this type of appliances at municipal scale, we just can read that they are taking into into account only the uh, the hot water 
and the number of, uh, of um, let's say, um, installation that they are just removed. Also, the in the case of, of heating, for instance, there is a, a mention of the solar panels, but for instance, there is no, no ever mention of the cooling here in this type of, of indicators in the SEAPs. And even for heating, there is somehow a poor coverage on the type of technologies that are really taken into account, their cost or their uh, technological implications in the SEAP. So just to conclude, SEAPs are very an excellent, uh, let's say, tool to let's say to um, advance on decarbonization, but many many of the specific aspects of given technologies for cooling and even for heating are not taken into account, and the monitoring tools to really assess the impact of these technologies is quite uh, limited up to date. There is no clear relation with the resources available in the territory, like for instance geothermal or solar, and it's not this is not taken into account usually in many of the CFs in Europe and. Therefore, we need really a better understanding of what resources are available locally and what are the best technological approaches in the SEAP and how these approaches are going to be monitored throughout the development of the SEAP. So this is what we are going to talk about here. In cooling down, we will implement a strategy to try to improve the situation and to get a better knowledge and information on how in the cities, in the pilot city, but also as a methodology in general, this type of strategies can be improved. For that, we are going to use a system which is called a Territorial Emission Information System. In the Spanish acronym, it would be CITE, in which information and communication technologies data system will be used to assist in improving our understanding about the magnitude and origin of the greenhouse gas emissions at local and regional scale, and also to identify, also in terms of economics, let's say, how much it costs, how much CO2 can be abated, with the specific measures we are going to implement in cooling down and also to verify the success through a specific and through a fruitful, let's say, monitoring strategy at local scale. So here I would like to give just a brief outline on how we can better measure, measure and um, let's say uh, characterize greenhouse gas emissions. And there is a approach called top-down approach, which is a very exact one because the these uses as uh, information source, what are the ground through level greenhouse gas emissions. This type of uh, country level uh, reports are done in under the realm, under the umbrella of the Kyoto protocols, and all countries have uh, greenhouse gas inventors, which are quite, uh, let's say, well developed and can be used also for the communities. The advantage of these greenhouse gas emission reports and, and, and data sets is that they are current, they are standardized and give a very complete picture about the, all the emissions in the territory. So we can compare them and we can also assess what a given sector of emissions is it, it's as an impact for the global emissions. But the, the, the drawback of this type of information sources is that there is no standards and homogeneous criteria on how to partition, how to, uh, let's say, to assign these emissions to a specific region, a specific country or a specific city. So the second big trouble is it takes typically two to three years to, let's say, to update this information. So today we would be speaking in Spain about the emissions of 2020. So it is very difficult with this type of shift in the data and in the, in the data stream and in the time to use this type of information for a strategy for the future. So this data are mainly useless for measures at the local scale. On the other hand, we have the bottom up. Bottom up means we would use data, let's say, uh, produced in the in the local scale, in the city, in the territory, to uh, combine them with well local, the well known, let's say, coefficients of emissions for greenhouse gases, and then calculate what would be the emissions or in the local scale. This is uh, uh, much more exact. It, this could be even linked to a monitoring strategy, but the big drawback is that there we have exceedingly complex monitoring. Uh, this would be very expensive and the cost of such a measure to make it really for all the sectors would be exceeding. So often this type of bottom-up approaches are not really available in the territory and we cannot have or rely on them to really calculate the CO2 emissions at the local scale and to assess the impact of a certain measure. So what could we do in our strategy, which is called CITE, we are going to combine the best of all, both worlds. We are going to use top-down strategy to infer what would be mainly 
the main emitters in the territory, all, all sources, including the traffic industry, also the, the public buildings, and to carry out a digitally enhanced bottom-up follow-up, which are the most important emitters in the territory. So what we typically would see with such strategy that only five to six sectors are really, really the most important sectors for emissions, like covering 80 to 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions in a typical city. So it's much more easy after identifying what are these emitters to really develop monitoring strategies which are cost efficient and which really concentrate on those emitters which are important. Typically, typically one of the most important emitters is the buildings and specifically the, uh, let's say, what would be the heating and cooling sectors in the building. So with this type of strategy, we could get both an impact assessment and a concentration of the most important emissions and also a strategy for verification and monitoring at the minimum cost. So this is the strategy we are going to, let's say, to demonstrate in cooling down how we can, with this type of strategy, combine the information gathered from the pilot uh, pilot appliances we are going to have, the pilot demonstrators in, the, in our project, which are several buildings which combine all the possible cooling technologies, uh, giving us information about the KPIs, their performances, their uh, emission factors, and also combine them at the top or the country level to the characteristic of the, uh, let's say, for instance, the global emissions factors for the electricity grid, which is very important to really assess what is the, let's say, do the relative uh, savings on in terms of greenhouse gases of a specific technology. You must know what is really the, uh, the mix of your electricity sector, or even your local electricity grid, to really understand what is this impact in decarbonization. This combination can then lead to a really meaningful strategy at local level, which combines all this information within this strategy of combining the top-down and the bottom-up approach, concentrating on the most important buildings or the most important emitters in the territory. So we can also link this to the re available renewable resources like geothermal, solar, even biomass in certain circumstances. And we will demonstrate this specifically in the city of Valencia, where we have a lot of information about the every type of emitters we have at local scale, and we can link this to the city strategy. So the two aims of our project in this in this part is the to gather or integrate without with this city strategy the calculation of a correlation matrix between the different sets of measures typically included in the SEAPs and their CO2 mitigating effect. All the, also, the typical cost aspects in terms of euros per ton of CO2 abated will be included in the study. And as a, as a product, as a result for the project and for the exercise with the city of Valencia, where we have the collaboration of the uh, city council here, is to establish a template for such SEAP cooling chapter, which could be really useful not only for the city of Valencia, but also for all the cities in Europe, if you could include it in the uh, let's say in the documents, in the strategies for the strategy energy, energy action plans in, in Europe. So we hopefully can contribute with this in pulling down to not only improve the situation of our pilot cities, but also to get an understanding on how the different cooling technologies really can impact in the abatement of CO2 emissions in the different cities in Europe. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope it has been clear. It's should, it's certainly very concentrated, but I hope I have not gone from too much from my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravian. It's quite interesting to look at that. Indeed, as mentioned also by uh, Madis in uh, his presentation, uh, where will be needed uh, from uh, cities, especially the one with uh, more than 45,000 emissions to have a real eating and cooling plan. So indeed, it's welcome that this uh, CEPs can uh, provide best practices and how to have them also with a cooling chapter. Thank you, Javier. So I was mentioning the uh, introduction of this um, session, but unfortunately, Gus van Gelder from Groenland in the last minute cannot present his case to the WWF Center in uh, UK. So I've just shared with you a short presentation uh, that we have from the project uh, Cooling Done on a question um, we highlighted uh, several times uh, during the discussion today is a data center. So I just present you briefly 
the case studies of um, Eurostat. So you all know Eurostat is this uh, European uh, body uh, for the um, stake, uh, stock market, uh, regrouping several stock markets uh, um, in Europe. And they had a data center in London. Uh, following the Brexit, they decided to move it to Italy to, to Bergamo. Um, what they use is geothermal cooling. Uh, it was presently briefly by, by a revenge, so I will not be uh, too long on that, but more or less with geothermal, you can do two types of cooling. You can do passive cooling, or we call free cooling because it's for free, and active cooling where you use uh, some energy. So you can see from, from the graph uh, how you, you do that, you circulate uh, uh, the heat or, or the cold from the underground to a pipe, and uh, we have a heat exchange or a heat pump to cool your building. So what happened in, 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 um, in, in Bergamo? Um, it's this uh, Euronext data center uh, with a full uh, geothermal cooling. It's quite a big center. Uh, you will see in the next slide some uh, short information. I really recommend you to visit the web page and also the YouTube video if you want to know all the details about it. But it's a global cloud data center, a surface larger than 17,000 square meters with a capacity over than 165,000 physical servers, so quite, quite big. And it's located so in Bergamo. Uh, as I mentioned, you have a, a video tour with also the explanation of, of a cooling system. So uh, they did that uh, in 21 and 22. So in 14 months, I think uh, they organized the move and it's uh, uh, in operation for, for, for nearly one year. Uh, the new data center is 1% green energy because it uses uh, electricity from photovoltaic and hydroelectric um, to power the system. And it uses uh, geothermal uh, cooling and dynamic free cooling uh, to, to cool the, the different servers. You can see a photo of a, of a building. Uh, they have their own well. So indeed, it's, they are not uh, buying the, the, the cooling. They operate their own wells in, in, in the site. And you can see here, uh, a screenshot of, of, of a system and the video, 3D video tool. Um, I will not go to the technical detail because uh, we will probably present that in, in a detailed manner in, in, in our project as, as a case study. but there are four primary cold water lines uh, which follow two different paths. And you can see here the, the scheme of a uh, of system. So as I mentioned, it was a, a last minute presentation, so I cannot provide much more detail than that, but I really recommend you to go to the LinkedIn page of uh, Euronext where they explain this new core data center. And they have also a YouTube video, 10 minutes uh, video, where they explain all the components of this data center. I thank you for, for, for your attention. It was just a last minute presentation from my side to point to be general cooling, but no, let's move to the last presentation of the day and give the floor to Christian Alter for presenting us cooling from solar thermal. Christian, the floor is yours. So good afternoon from my side. Thanks for the invitation. Now, first I have to close. I did a mistake when I took the invitation. I missed that my calendar said I'm on holiday. So you got a presentation sitting on the olive trees in Italy at the moment. Uh, and just a moment to start my PowerPoint here. Um, let's go. Oops. So I'm talking here about uh, the biggest solar heating and cooling system with a heat purchase agreement we have established. It's sitting in Graz, Austria. And customer for this system is the company AVL. Now, what is AVL doing? AVL is a huge engineering company with 11,500 employees, and they are developing, simulating, and testing all types of powertrain system, uh, engine motor technology, and all of that. And they have a lot of climate chambers to test all different uh, climates, almost from tropical to Arctic climates. And for that, they have a big demand of heating and cooling. And those guys for sure have a, in, have a big environmental commitment working on automotive system, powertrain system means you're very exposed to emissions, to saving of emissions. So green thinking is a kind of need for the future. And we got in touch 
almost eight years back. And at the time, they said, we want to do a solar system on the parking, uh, which, where you see here the red marks on the roof, because we have two issues. The one is we want to reduce our natural gas consumption um, and, we and, and, and to get out of this uh, decarbonization to a certain extent. On the other hand, we want to cover this roof uh, with a new structure, because when we have the rare winds of snow, everything is blocked. We don't know where to put the snow all around. It's just company uh, ground. We cannot drop it anywhere. So put a solar roof on it and make us happy. And that's part of the system was actually implemented in 2017. So you see, we built a storage tank. We built 1,584 square meters of solar collectors. And we built all these contracts on heat purchase agreement with the company Solar Navi. I'm doing the investment and the energy out of the system is sold uh, to AVL. Uh, that was step one. And actually it happened quite quickly that we recognized, hey, in summer, sometimes they are low on business. We have surplus on solar energy and we're getting in challenging situations on that. The other thing was, there were benefits clearly by the natural gas reductions we had by having the roof uh, covered, but there was a clear limitation already in this phase by the heat offtake they had. And actually the question which popped up in our discussion, is this really all solar heat can do for, for AVL? And there is a lot of new, a lot of more roofs that you see around. There was actually at that time significant uh, waste heat away label, which came from engine testing uh, at certain points of time. They had a strong increasing need of cooling, especially in the process part, as, but as well a little bit on the air conditioning part. And all the cooling was built on pure electric chillers, and they did have sometimes issues on power supply where they could not provide all the electricity for the chillers, so there was a certain need of redundancy for emergency situations. And we said, okay, we have solar, a solar field there, we have a storage there, why shouldn't we add here uh, to the heating a cooling process? And that gives us the possibility of extending the existing solar array because we can overcome the limitation of the summer offtake for heat only. So we developed that concept uh, in the beginning, and I mentioned it shortly, we integrated the waste heat option. Now it happened meanwhile that the waste heat that comes out from engine testing has totally disappeared. There is no combustion engine testing anymore. So the waste heat, which was an initial part of additional heat source for the thermal driven absorption chiller, that part is crossed out of our original concept, but we moved on with adding the chiller and extending the solar collectors. We do have the roughly one megawatt uh, solar heating capacity installed in stage one. We added uh, 1,900 meters square, giving a total capacity of 1.3 megawatt. Uh, we added here the absorption heat pump. Um, and with this new setting, we could increase significantly solar supply. You see here actually uh, the, the picture uh, from the sky. So the middle roof was the initial one, the left and the right roof were the ones that were added in stage actually two and three, but almost at the same time. Now, these graphs explains why this combination of heating and cooling makes so much sense. The orange part of this graph is actually the heat demand we have, both for the process heat and the space heating. Uh, for sure, it doesn't uh, represent the full winter part, but it shows what we can supply with solar. And the blue part is really what we can contribute here from the solar system to the cooling. And you see actually that we have roughly tripled the solar contribution uh, to substitute uh, fossil fuels and, and as well the cooling by this combination as we simply can use the surplus of solar heat into providing sustainable cooling here. Uh, summarizing here some key facts. So the overall solar array is now around 3,500 meters square with a capacity of 2.3 megawatt. We have an absorption chiller with 650 uh, kilowatt and that actually operates 
uh, up to 18 hours uh, a day because we have surplus from the day, which we can take out from the storage tank. And we have here the carbon savings, uh, almost triple compared to the initial, uh, to the initial uh, design and layout. All of this is built in heat purchase agreements. So AVL is just receiving the services and we have the heat meter, which is our interface in the accounting. The operational responsibility is on our side uh, through the investment. I'm getting you some pictures how the system finally looks. So you see here uh, on the left side, an overview about all the solar arrays. Uh, and they complete shortly before the completion. As you see some uninsulated pipes in the in the front. At the right side, you see the absorption chiller, which is sitting in the central chiller room. And yeah, that was in a short run uh, what what we did on this system. And I think this combination of heating and cooling really allows us to do, depending on the on the heat load profiles of certain customers, but it allows us to double, triple, or, or multiple actually the potential we have from solar heat combined to a pure heating design where we always face this situation with the plus in the summer, which we need to do smartly and, and put it to usage as we did here. So I hope there were some interesting ideas for you. Thanks for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Christian, for your availability from your holiday season and for this clear attention on solar thermal. Let's maybe look at if we have some questions before I give a photo to Saverio Papa for the conclusions. And indeed, I think we have some questions. More panelists. Um, to Javier, you have a question from Alex Obe. Uh, who would you know? Would you know the reason why certain countries have most have almost no CAPS? <laughs> it's a, I, I don't know exactly. The, 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 if you look at the map I showed you, uh, there are countries where there are a lot of dots you could see, and there are countries which are let's say quite quite more sparse the dots. <laughs> I think I think at least in my region I know that a certain uh, um, let's say a certain uh, public administration have put the CEAP as a precondition to get to cert certain subsidies, for instance, for public administration. So, for instance, in Valencia, if a city wants to apply for certain subsidies for improvement of uh, local appliances in the municipal, they have to do they have to have a CEAP. So this was definitely a reason where, why many many cities they adhered. To the CEAPs, and then they had to follow up this uh, building up CEAP strategies and so on. And I think this is the case in Spain, and possibly it was also the case in Italy, as far as I have heard. So it's, this is possibly the origins. In, in some countries, the CEAP has been taken as for for some public administrations, let's say, as, as a condition for public subsidies for the local administration, but maybe not the only reason. Okay, do we have a last round of question? No, so it seems that we are coming to, ah, uh, yes, one last, in the last segment. I know, some are coming, so <laughs> asking that to raise question. So from Frank Bonbon, how do you see geothermal in the light of innovation? I'm referring to the innovation fund possible, but as it puts new ways, new technologies to reduce carbon, we like to promote geothermal cooling eating for this geothermal load. So maybe to you, Javier, better than for me, how huh. do you see uh, geothermal in, uh, in, in, in the right of, uh, of innovation and especially for, for new technologies in cooling? Let's say in the context of the SEAPs? No, a... in terms of research and innovation. Well, I think uh, there is a lot of research and innovation on, on geothermal. As, as you know, there have been many, many projects and there are ongoing projects. So there's a bright future, I think, for, for geothermal in terms of, of innovation, of application. Um, I think we have to invest a lot in, in better understanding the, the resources, the geothermal resources. For instance, in the context of the SEAPs, it would be very important that the cities have, let's say, that the, the European cities have all, uh, let's say, a local resource map in terms of geothermal, but also including where, let's say, all, all the regulatory and uh, administrative barriers or limitations that may be at local scale 
for geothermal. So I think this is something to, to be developed, really the methodological, uh, let's say, uh, common scale in Europe. And I think this is something that could really facilitate the adoption of geothermal. And then, of course, in the in the different technologies, there is a lot of to do in terms of reducing costs, for instance, which is still one of the factors which limit geothermal. But also, we have we are seeing now the integration in the local system, the local energy system. So I think there are many aspects. For instance, uh, geothermal are great for cooling and heating. Let's say it's a it's an example of a of a, of a technology which integrates two sectors of the energy system like cooling and heating in a very very efficient and, and sensible way and also with electricity so i think there's a lot of to do in terms for geothermal in particular in terms of integration like resource mapping integration of the technologies in the in the local energy system etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm sure that will be a bright future for for geothermal research thank you Ravi. and now to conclude i will you the last two question is to you christian uh, yep. From first from Ufa Ematabali, is that how high is the supply temperature of the solar collectors, which serve as a heat source of absorption chiller? It's the first question. The second question from Valérie Sejourné is is which percentage of heating and cooling needs are covered by are covered by solar thermal now for AVL? Mm -hmm. So on the first question, the solar collectors we use here go up to 110 degrees C, which, which is the max temperature our tank is certified for. And actually for a double glazed flat plate collector, this is a temperature which is uh, still reasonable, but when you get higher, uh, you really feel the uh, drop of efficiency on high temperatures. And ideally the absorption chiller, it's rated for supply of 88 degrees C, but we can go above that uh, when the profile or the tank requires that and get out a little bit more cooling on that. Now talking on Valerie's question, uh, well, let's say uh, as, as a consumption is rather volatile uh, because it's process related in AOL and depending on what they do on, on, on how many test runs you need to, to how strongly they use the climate camber, chambers. I would say it's something between 25 and 35% uh, on average, what we can cover with heating and cooling here at the moment. Okay, thank you, Christian, for this uh, quite uh, summarized answer. I think perfectly the question. And with that, I'm closing now the, the second session. I thank you, the two panelists, Christian and, and Ravia, for, for your presentation. And it's my pleasure not to give the floor to Savio Papa from Solar Each Up for the concluding remarks. Savio, for yours. Thanks a lot, Philip. And yeah, so just to conclude very briefly, uh, just two comments from my side. Uh, first of all, Thanks, Philip, for moderating, and thanks to all our speakers for uh, presenting the growing importance of uh, the cooling sector and uh, how uh, yeah, renewable cooling technologies such as geothermal and solar thermal can play a role, not only in meeting the demand for cooling, but also to provide uh, stability to the um, uh, overall energy system. Uh, and that was the main point. The second point, uh, which was touched upon uh, uh, by several speakers, uh, was about the importance of uh, planning uh, and availability of data at member state level, but also at local level. Uh, there we have uh, two points. So first, uh, member states need to be compliant uh, with uh, EU legislation. So uh, the comprehensive assessments were mentioned, and there we see that some of the member states, uh, although this is a legal requirement, uh, still lack the revision of these uh, uh, comprehensive assessments. And the second point, uh, so their member states really need to step up their efforts and uh, yeah, put some efforts into providing the data for heating and cooling. And the second point, of course, is the local planning and the local availability of data. And there I was very interested by the presentation by Javier, because I think uh, he really showed uh, how the we need to combine the national level and the local level uh, to have reliable data 
And there we're very happy that the energy efficiency directive is now requiring municipalities uh, above uh, 45,000 people uh, to uh, implement and put in place uh, local planning, local plans for heating and cooling. But it's also, of course, important that member states do their part, especially in giving uh, local authorities the right skills, the right financial means, and everything they need to comply with this requirement in an effective way. So. Once again, uh, thanks a lot to uh, all the speakers and to Philippe. And yeah, on this note, uh, I will uh, I will close the session. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon.